thank you for being here. My name is Anita Vincent. Um, I am in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. I have uh, been involved in Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, as have my collaborators, Catherine Moresca and Elizabeth Weiss, uh, who will present alongside me today. Um, we have worked with children from ages three up to 15, and uh, we continue our work. And from our work, we have um, gathered some questions that we ponder about the children and who they are, the role of the adult and the role of the prepared environment. Um, so Catherine, Catherine, um, is a founder director of the Center for Children and Theology in Washington, DC. Um, she has been at the Christian Family Montessori School for many years and has much experience with children. And she will talk about the child. Elizabeth Weiss is in Charleston. Uh, she is a theologian with children. And uh, she will talk about the prepared environment where she is at the moment. So let us get started. I, um, we will each present um, so Catherine will talk about the child, and she has some questions as she goes through her presentation. Um, and then we will discuss, you know, um, talk about our thoughts, who this child is. And we will do that for each of our three parts. So... Should I go? <laughs> I'm gonna share the screen, so just give me a minute here with the with the presentation. I'm sorry. It's taking me a minute here. There we go. Hey. <laughs> Go ahead, Catherine. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad to be with you all. Uh, I I really want to start with a question uh, of this con of this uh, conference, which is whose children are they? Because I had an immediate response, and I'm wondering if any of you can just type, or all of you would type into the chat your your one word response to that to that question that sort of drove me to this conference and uh, may have cause you to think about it. Whose children are they? What would you say? <laughs> or what was your first thought when you heard the question? Gods, gods, gods. <laughs> There's. All of ours. So my mind quickly flicked through parents, the churches, you know, in the context of religious education, whose children are they? And, and then I thought, oh, they're their own. They're nobody's children. They're everybody's children, but mostly they're their own. And, uh, and that got me around to the word agency, agency of children in a life of faith. And so a lot of our children historically in religious education, now I'm talking about my 70 years and uh, you know from childhood up and uh, my mother's and so on, but there's been a sense of the faith belongs to the clergy or to the church. And we will put that in the child, uh, but it, uh, there's some sense of the child not owning the faith. Um, or having her own. And uh, my mother at the age of, of 80, about 88 said to me, you know, I don't say the creed. And I said, really, why not? Because she goes to church every Sunday, had been going to church every Sunday all her life. And she said, because I don't want other people to tell me 
what to believe. And I thought that's really interesting after all those years, you know, to get to that place. But it goes back, I'm sure, to her childhood where she was never asked what she believed. I started studying theology as a freshman in college. Our professor asked wonderful, wonderful questions. And then she proceeded to answer them all. And I was so excited when I heard the questions and so disappointed that she answered all the questions, <laughs> you know, over the course of the semester. And I, that was my feedback to her at the end. And her face just fell because she loved theology. But I didn't really care about her theology so much as <laughs> what, what ours might be. And so the, the work we do in the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd leans heavily on the work of Maria Montessori and um, Sophia Cavalletti, who was a theologian uh, working in Rome with children and her uh, and a Montessori colleague of hers, John Agobi. And the three of them all have really a firm um, grounding in the agency of children that the children self-construct. Um, and we can see this more easily if you talk about if you talk about food, you know, who gives the child food? You know, do they own the child's diet or the, the child's nutrition? And ultimately you can say, yes, you can feed, you can feed your child, but who eats, who digests, who uses that food, you know, who decides what comes and stays and goes and so on, you know, and it's the child that does all the work or the human being. Same with language, you know, we can choose the language we're going to speak around our children, but they take it in and they construct language within, and eventually that comes out. Uh, movement, you know, children can't learn to move by watching it. They have to do it. That's part of their self-construction. And so does this also apply to faith? And in the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, we would answer that with a firm yes. <laughs> and so a child in a, in a, in a relationship with God uh, is a partner in the covenant. That is how Sophia Cavalletti spoke of the child's faith. So not someone who was passive, just receiving the faith, but a creator and a partner, partner in the relationship with God. And once you have a relationship in play, you who might be saying, okay, I'm going to introduce you to God. Uh, your, your job then is to get out of the way of that relationship that you're, you're hoping to foster. The more you're in the relationship, the more the child can't own it. <laughs> and so, so how can we get out of the way? And uh, Elizabeth talking about the um, environment, the prepared environment is, is our best tool for getting out of the way of the relationship, the child's relationship with God. Um, we do have a role as adults, and Anita will address that. So my focus will be on the child and, um, and their agency. So my answer to this question, you know, who's, whose child is it, is they're their own. <laughs> and I don't think they can be a partner in the covenant, you know, without, without that answer. And there are, there's truth to every other possible answer we can think of. You know, they belong to the universe. They belong to the community. They belong to God. They belong to the parents and so on. But they have to be their own. They have to have agency. So I'm a, a Christian, and I'm, I'm not sure that the, the panel I went to this morning was had Jewish people and Sikh and you know others. So I I don't I don't want to assume that all of you are Christian, but I'm speaking from a Christian um, perspective. So uh, please, if you if you are you know translating this into another uh, context, feel free you know to to think of examples from your own tradition and to share those. Um, but as a Christian, I'm looking at Jesus and how did he model the eight giving the agency of faith to his followers. We know he taught. Were those people passive? Um, so he offered them parables and miracles, and both of these are referred to as signs. And so the, the, the gift, the role of Jesus is to say, here's a way to think about the kingdom of God. Here's a way to think about uh, the Son of God. Here's a way to think about um, 
God herself. And I'm going to tell you a story. And then I'm going to let you go with that. And so there's not too much explanation of the signs or explanation of the parables. That's the work of the people, the listeners. And that's how Jesus modeled agency of the people that Jesus was teaching. And so uh, I, I think after Jesus, you know, we have a generation of church fathers and the early church and so on, who were really scratching their heads over what all this meant and figuring it out and working it out. And they eventually came up with something called the creed and other documents that sort of are foundational to Christianity. And what, what, they, what they came up with was how they would interpret the signs of Jesus for their time and for their culture and for their life situation. So we are not going back to those interpretations. They have their place, they have their use, but they're not definitive and they're not final. So what we give the children are the stories freely, unattached to all, all that others had to say about them and say, would you like to think about this? And let them do that. And we have concrete materials that, that facilitate that. And so they can spend time with, the way we might go back to a passage in the Bible that we want to reread, they can spend time with a passage with, this, with the material, and it can be as long as they want, and it can be with a friend, or it can be by themselves, or maybe they'll have an adult by their side. That is their choice. And whatever they have to think or say about it, you know, it's not going to be the last word that they ever think or say about it, but that is also theirs. They own it. And that time of considering the sign is a time that we feel is done in the presence of the Holy Spirit and with the help of the Holy Spirit. So it's a time of relationship. So how are we giving freedom you know, to others? as church people, as religious educators, whether they're children or whether they're, you know, adults. Um, this is always both a, a, a task before us and a gift, because if you don't have to figure it out for them, it's so much easier. <laughs> so all you're doing is giving them this gift. Here's a lovely sign for you to think about and, and let it go. And so, uh, you know, that takes a lot of load off of us. Do I have to, do I have to interpret this for the children? No. Do I have to interpret this for anybody? No. And I think all our liberation theologies are, you know, the work of people who said, wait a minute, wait a minute, you know, my world is quite different from the context of what the church fathers were working in. And I have some different things to think about these signs. And so they took agency. And they vastly enrich our understanding of our faith. And what I want to say is children are one of those groups. We don't even have a name for it exactly, but uh, they're, they're one of the liberation communities of the church, you know, who have something unique to say about our faith, a perspective that does not belong to any other. And it was one of the few that Jesus actually pointed out. He said, unless you become like little children, you won't enter the kingdom of God. One of the minorities that he specifically and often spoke about, um, look at it from this perspective rather than just the, um, the leadership of the, of the faith. So the first question that I want you to think about, we won't discuss it yet, but just, just make a note, is um, what are the possible gifts for children, adults, and the community of faith. If children's understanding and relationship with God is brought forward. So what do they have to offer us? What can we learn about our own faith from the children? 
And of all of all these children that we've worked with from ages three to 15, I wanna focus on the three to six year old child because they have a particular set of characteristics and gifts that um, are, are quite different from um, you know, other stages of, of childhood and adulthood. And um, I wanna speak of three of them. And one is essentiality. And so this was a um, characteristic that I, it took me a while to get my head around when Cavaletti was introducing it. But she's saying, if you go, if you go in front of children and start talking about what the priest is wearing, or you know, what the name of the house the priest lives in is, or you know, how how the church is run by the parish council or the vestry or whatever that's not essential that's not the faith that's 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 stuff <laughs> that has its place in church life but it's not the faith and so what is at the heart of our faith what is the most life-giving announcements of our faith and um sophia found that if she offered children something from what we might call the whole body of faith that wasn't essential, that wasn't at the heart, that wasn't the most life-giving, they ignored it. They didn't go back to it. They didn't find joy in it. They just ignored it. And if it did, if, it, if the children did respond to it by repeating it frequently, by finding their own way to say it, um, then that was an indication to Cavaletti that this is essential. This is the heart of our faith. And I, as an adult who learned this work, you know, knew a lot of things about my faith. Wasn't sure if I had to believe every line of it in order to call myself a Christian. I hadn't sorted out what was essential and what was not essential. And to have that gift from children vastly reassured me in my own faith. It was a true, true gift. Um, she talks about joy. And uh, part of the, the gift of joy is that children do not understand or have no concern about moral behavior, ethical behavior, good and bad. This is not a category which children under six think in. And so religion can't be about what you do or how good or bad you are. Religion then falls into, well, what is religion? It's not about being good or bad or who, who you know, how well I behave. Well, religion is relationship with God. Our faith is about our relationship with God. And that's essential. And so the child has no fear of God, no concern about judgment, um, not worried about vocation, not worried about the future, living totally in the present and just enjoying the presence of God through all the gifts, all the ways that God has given God's self to us. And so, uh, and then finally we have wonder. And wonder has been recognized for many, you know, since many years before Jesus as a sign of childhood and a gift of childhood. Um, but there are, you know, children a little older who, you start to say, let's let's look at this again. And they're like, I already have that. I already know that. I'm not going to be surprised by that. And it takes a little, takes a little uh, coaxing to get them to say, there's another level of meaning here. You're a little older, you're going to have a change, you're going to enjoy it, that they'll, you know, they'll fall into it. But little children, what what um, nurtures wonder for them, they will return to again and again. They do not get to the end of the depths. Of the good of the good things of our of our tradition, and this would be the good things of any tradition. Uh, so their capacity for wonder is also sort of a capacity for um, meditation or reflection, contemplation. Um, so those three gifts are gifts for the children that are the foundation of their faith life, but they're also gifts for the church. And they're also the foundation of our faith life. We who were children 
once upon a time. <laughs> and so if we go back to that foundation, go back to what we might have perceived of God as a five-year-old, you know, what made us wonder then, we can recapture some of the essentiality, some of the wonder, and some of the joy of the capacity of those young children. Um, so the question then is, what can we learn about our faith from children who are uniquely able to discover and share uh, the essentiality and wonder and joy of our faith? So with that, <laughs> um, I'm going to invite you to comment or reflect or respond or... Yeah, if you'd like to put comments or questions in the chat or raise your hand if you have something that you'd like to share, we'd welcome that now. Okay, so the questions that um, Catherine put out, particularly the last one, what, how can our faith life be informed um, as we watch children into relationship with God and live that relationship with God? Well, as we continue to ponder that, Elizabeth can present a little bit more that will help us uh, think about that a little bit more. Let me share screen. Sorry, do that every time, y'all. I get ahead of the game. <laughs> I am in Charleston. Greetings from a hot, humid place that is gorgeous. And I am in the middle of our elementary camps. So camp let out for the day and we're here. And so I'm in my prepared environment for the elementary age child. And I spend my days pondering how... I can get out of the way and allow the ultimate teachers to teach the children and help them have a relationship with God. And in that, I kind of specialize a bit in the place where the children come together. And one of the greatest gifts that the eternal one gives to the child and to all humanity is the gift of creation. And in our Christian faith, humanity is called to model this gift. It should be bountiful. It should be interactive. It should be interdependent, ongoing, nurturing, and peaceful. And the Gospels tell us that this goal for humanity, that we might have life and have it abundantly, for the elementary age child, they grasp this idea of the peaceable kingdom. And they see that as what an abundant life must be. So the catechisms try to define the abundant life even more with words rather than with images. And they tell us that the purpose of humanity is to glorify God and enjoy God forever. 
And it seems to me that we should be having an ongoing conversation with God if that's where we're aiming for. And since it is a we idea, that means we have to be in conversation with the world around us. And so as Christian educators, we have a mandate to assist a child in discovering this lasting pathway to deep conversation with God and with the whole of creation. And in the Christian denominational world, about the last 150 years, there have been really specific approaches to educating children. However, there's actually been very little to almost zero implemented research and observational science that has been applied to any of these methods. And it is necessary for us then to say, let us see what others have said and done and look further afield with the knowledge that we must temper the contemporary best educational practices with the knowledge that relationships are formational and not just academic. And so I tend to gravitate nicely into the flow theory ideas and we understand that a person unveils a sense of purpose and meaning, and it drives further exploration and learning when a child or an adult can enter into flow. It's a period supported by having really high levels of control and a time for deep concentration. And this model requires, however, a built environment that can flex with a child's needs. Concurrent with the advent of flow theory, Drs. Taylor and Vlastos published their research pondering how built and constructed environments affect children's learning, and they adamantly stressed and continue through research to stress a need for reordering of an educator's and administrative understanding so the built environment is understood as the silent curriculum. It is supporting the needs of the child at their various ages and reaching into that child's life to have at its core a space for the child to best learn and grow. And I propose that we educators ponder the direct needs of a child inside religious formation spaces. Just as one prepares a soil before planting the seeds, as the old adage goes, we also must look at this and say, what are the balances of nutrients that keep young plants from starving or being burned? Our environment needs to be taking into account a goal beyond imparting facts, doctrine, and moral goodness. How can we create built and constructed environments where children engage in flow and thus more fully engage in conversations with God and the world? And in my particular brands of Protestant Christianity, Children's learning spaces began modeling themselves out of traditional classroom spaces. And over time, however, it was generally agreed that those learning classrooms provide very little motivation for children to continue in a learning process, much less stay inside of the faith community upon reaching adulthood. So quite often, they've taken another path and created exciting, play-filled, very bright, noisy environments. The question is, does this approach work to support the flow that would help a child have a meaningful conversation with God in the world? So again, we have to look outside of the Christian box here and look at educational pedagogies like Dr. Montessori's or Rudolf Steiner's, because both of them fit a spiritual aspect and component into their pedagogy. And they buck the idea that children learn best in rigorous, regimented, sterile education environments. So they proposed other directions to optimize a child's wonder and understanding of their world. So independently, they recognize the importance of creating spaces where children have high levels of control and time for deep concentration, a hundred years before flow theory came. And in fact, they use terms like third teacher, unhurried, natural educational womb, and co-educator when discussing the built environments that the children were inhabiting. Dr. Montessori determines that the first aim of the prepared environment, as far as it possible, she says, to render the growing child independent of the adult. And the young child constructs their identity by living within this environment and also by observing how others interact with it. 
And she says later, only those who are adapted to their environment can, said, can be said to be normal. And I am autistic, so normal is kind of one of those words I've never fit into, but normal means complete in their body for her. And for that, I am excited to have that joy. Sophia Cavaletti, who's a theologian, and then Gianna Gobi, who is a Montessorian, collaborated for more than 25 years to create an optimal learning environment for faith formation. They experimented. They took scientific research approach, careful documentation of this, and offered a space to the child to see what would happen. And they would tweak that periodically to see if something worked better or stepped away from something that they noticed was not being engaging for the children. Educational spaces, they argue, must be carefully curated through thoughtfully designed places. And children and adults have to live collaboratively in their religious experience. And I'm gonna quote here, please bear with me beyond the stilted language of a past generation. When the child arrives, it says, the teacher simply assists the child at the beginning to get his bearings among the many different things and teaches him the precise use of those things. That is to say, the teacher introduces him to the ordered and active life encased in the environment. And we must have the ability, she says, for the child to move freely and safely within this environment. She leaves him free in the choice and execution of his work. To assist in building this deep concentration, the environment is designed to encourage slow movement, soft lighting, zones of work divided by shelving, and very attractive materials that the child will want to work with independently and repeatedly. Cavaletti adds some observations as well. She says the environment must lead us to an interior dialogue between the child and the true teacher. I must make a caveat here that each religious education location is contextualized to a group of people, to their resources and the needs of that group. And if we try to innovate one plan that works in every location, we've lost sight of the actual environment as the collaborative teacher. And there are principles through which context can bring about unique expressions. In our prepared environments as a model of the gift of creation, we would support the child to become a lifelong friend with God and the world. And so our environments should embody these three characteristics of the gift of creation, hospitality. There's a lot that goes in here, y'all. This is everything from the baseline things, lighting, temperature, things that go for comfort, environmental noises and smells, the biphilic elements, which touch across all three of these wonderful spaces to enhance flow for children. And we, in the midst of those, we need to listen to the child's thoughts about lighting, sound, furniture, paint, the height of the shelves, the type of plants we have, all of those things, because flow will come more naturally to the child if they feel their voice is being heard. Children have the ability to choose their path towards Jesus and the church if the built and constructed environment is interactive. That means that the child can find a way of focusing their energy and reflect on the spiritual insights that they are gleaming with minimized adult assistance. Why does it need to be minimized? Because we have all learned that we best fit in our environment when we can embrace it, touch it, change it, manipulate it. Say, you know, maybe a second cup of tea would be good this morning. I am not prepared to enter the world as I am. <laughs> when we have that sort of control, then we have true ownership and have the agency to live in the world well. The prepared environment takes into account the comfort and ownership if it is beautiful. And we place into that natural materials and textures that call for touch and exploration. Paint colors are chosen to point to the items in the room 
and not to compete with them. This supports the child's entrance into flow. The rooms art, teaching tools, all of those sorts of things represent the core values of the worshiping community and they are distilled to their essence, which does not mean that we lessen their impact. That just means that we must know in our own selves exactly what is the core of our value set. The organization of items in the room does not overwhelm the child. This calls out to the child to be curious and invokes questions and exploration. The ergonomics of furniture, if a child is uncomfortable, no matter how much they would like to work, they can't because the discomfort in their body is going to inhibit them entering into flow. So scale and ergonomics matter. Plants and animals, here we are again with these. They create space for children to see nature as something to be cared for and to be partnered with and then be in conversation with God with. A visually central prayer table encourages children to come and interact with it, set the table, sing a song, do all the things that living within our group asks for. Nook areas and quiet desk spaces allow children to work on self-regulation and provide boundaries for others to learn that they should not be crossing that. This person needs a space to be quiet. Being self-regulated, exploration, all of these sorts of things allow for creative responses and prayerful activity. And the surfaces are uncluttered and supplies being accessible allows the child to work to their fullest capacity. There's even one thing more than the interdependence that comes from living in community. That is the interdependence of all of us. And by living in a community where each person's unique gifts and talents have space to flourish, we can grow in respect for those different from ourselves. The children collaborate to care for, enhance and nurture the environment. And they begin with the room and expand to the church and further afield into the wide world of community with others. The necess necessary skills that are developed through the work taking place in these specially prepared environments encourage children to find purpose and resilience as well as recognize their limitations and ask for help. So we have a lovely little young lady who came in around two and she got very excited to sweep up little pieces of paper. In fact, she got so excited about that that she would tear up paper just so she could sweep them up. And now she is a lovely young lady of five and she lives within the community proudly and loudly. And she most recently sat with six other children and got an old set of sewing machine legs and cleaned the rust off of them. We sealed them for them since the chemicals were harsh. And then we designed a table together. That is their table that lives in the foyer of our church. And they can point to that and say, we did that. We made a space beautiful for our community. That is what it means to be interdependent. Decades of research have taught us that we have to take into account factors like the light, the smell, the sound, and we have to have an anchor. And that anchor of the built environment allows us to ponder God in a very different way and to interact with God at our own pace and our own time, engaging our intellectual curiosity at different developmental levels. It has to be independent, but not performative. So the child's skills have a direction to support the abundant life in Christ across the whole gift of creation. The abundant life in Christ is able to take root and spread lives of creative hospitality and interdependent interactions with all of creation. And by having a built environment that does these goals, we don't have that weight on our shoulders. That is the weight of the environment. And it is more than capable of supporting this child's conversation with God and all of creation. Thanks. Um, so my question 
My ending point question for you is, I wonder how does the physical environment assist the child to live into the covenantal relationship with God and with others to fulfill their cosmic task? And so those are kind of, that is where I sit and ponder on a daily basis. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And I'm so sorry about things going all over. It's okay. I'm, I'm, my brain sees the world all at once anyway, so there it is. And I want to tell a story about the prepared environment that uh, that I really enjoyed. My my second daughter brought a friend home when she was five, and our front door opens. If you just open it like forty five degrees, you're aiming right for the closet rather than the room, the living room. <laughs> and so she, she opens the door forty five degrees, and her and her friend walks basically through the front door into the closet, where there's a set of low hooks for children to hang their coats. And she said, oh, Katie, I love your house. <laughs> so what about that environment said to her, you know, there's a place for you here. You can be independent here. You can, you know, you can hang up your coat and be comfortable. And that's, that's the impact of just a very small detail. But, you know, when we prepare an environment for children, that's sort of the way we're thinking, you know. Uh, Karen Marie, you asked um, how this affects neurodiverse um, folks. Uh, prepared environment is huge. Um, being able to know what's coming, to not have too many sights, sounds, smells. I hear electricity in walls. Um, so for me, being around fluorescent lights is really challenging. The discovery of air defenders is magnificent. Um, but those sorts of things really deeply can impact a neurodiverse child. Also, it impacts children with spatial awareness issues as well. So a room that is less tightly packed can allow them to have the space they need to stretch out and move and be on the floor and get that hard sensory contact that they might need. I can go into that more fully if other people would like that, but... It is a huge thing for neurodiverse folk. Elizabeth, Nolan, yeah. yeah. Hi, this is the first time I've had to uh, differentiate with surnames. Hello from Australia. Uh, pardon my earlier time, I had to have some breakfast. Um, it's it's um, uh, nine o'clock here now. Uh, just wanting to respond on uh, the, the environment uh, for children. Um, I became really aware of the difference between the fact that often uh, education for uh, early childhood was rich in, in colours and in um, stimuli around the classrooms uh, compared with secondary schools and then at university. Uh, Union Theological Seminary in 1983 uh, was uh, such a brown bare place. Uh, it was just so boring. And so, you know, the the created environment as well as the natural environment, I think is so important for all forms of learning for all ages. And we can learn so much from early childhood educators uh, and from the children in terms of what they appreciate. I just wanted to add to uh, Marissa's, uh, Catherine's story, sorry. Um, when I was in a, a manse uh, a couple of years ago, my three-year-old great niece uh, came up to me and said, Auntie Beth, you live in a house for children. And I said, <laughs> oh, um, why is that, uh, Grace? And she said, because I can reach the, the light switches. <laughs> they, were, they were at, um, you know, waist height for adults, but height for children and I had never thought about the fact that so often our light switches are uh, higher a and building a house for children I think is a, a wonderful thing I would like all uh, house builders to uh, to do that um, and uh, anyway enough thank you we are getting our um, educational spaces rewired at this current moment and the uh, electrician I 
had a rather pointed conversation that I wanted the plugs higher than the light switches. And he was not in my, for my three to six and zero to three rooms. And he was really having a very hard time wrapping his mind around that. <laughs> but we got there in the end. You know. Such a really safer decision. Wonderful. Any other thoughts about the physical environment and the trails? So there's two questions that I put in the chat. How can we create the environment that will assist the child to engage in flow? Right? In other words, enter more deeply into contemplation of that relationship with God. And how does a well-prepared environment assist the child to live into that relationship? I mean, it's, it's great to have um, light switches and coat hooks, but really for our purposes, we're talking about facilitating that relationship with God mm -hmm. and allowing the child to use their own agency in order to do so. So what thoughts do you have about that? What has been your experience with children or adolescents in that regard? Thank you, Karen Marie. So when children can inhabit their bodies without frustration over all the things they cannot do, they have more time and space to contemplate God. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth Nolan, be careful of the biblical images shown to children. Um, some images are really deforming or fear creating. Elizabeth, you want to say something more about that? Um, yes. Sure. One of the uh, concerns that I have uh, as an educator um, has been uh, some of the uh, artwork that uses, uh, that's being used uh, to put into Bibles. So, for example, uh, the Bible that was used about or came 10 or more years ago that was called... Um, God's Big Adventure or something like that. It was a contemporary English version. But the the illustrations of the people were just uh, such straight, cartoony, um, very negative, fearful images. Um, I, I can't explain it. I'll go and get the Bible. Um, but it, they, so the, the artwork that people think is contemporary artwork can in fact be um, very fear creating. The children uh, thought that why are the disciples, this is a question, why are the disciples so angry in this picture? And they weren't angry at all, but it looked like they were fearful. So uh, I think the images that we show children and that we put up, uh, we need to be questioning in terms of the built environment for them, in terms of deforming their, their trust in uh, a, uh, a loving God. That's, that's all. Thank you, Elizabeth. I know Elizabeth Weiss has things to say about that. <laughs> uh, we make sure our art here follows across space of the world. So the breadth of what is being done contemporarily and historically. Um, so the children see faith from its beginning phases. Um, and right now in our camp, we're looking at early mosaics and creating early mosaics um, that you would have seen across the early church world, depending on location. Um, and we also want kids to recognize that faith isn't just American with little TM after it, that our faith is a universal space and occupies contextualization. 
Um, and that's a huge piece of hospitality. If everything in your space is white and blonde and smiling, that's a very different world. When I have three Gullah children, Gullah Geechee children come into our space. Um, and we need to say that we also recognize the presence of Christ in you. And we can't do that if everybody looks the same. This is a huge battle I fight all the time. It's like a soapbox. I can stand on it and scream about it all day long. Um, Kevin uh, asks Catherine, Catherine, you've written about using the challenging stories of scripture with children, especially the violent passages. Could you say a bit more about how to help young people encounter these passages with wonder and towards finding joy? Have you enjoyed new insights since publishing the book in 2019? Of course, if you keep reading the Bible, you will always enjoy new insights, <laughs> and especially if you're reading the Bible with children. So uh, that is true. But the, the book was written at, you know, after about 35 years of reading these passages with children. So I had learned quite a lot from them. Um, that the point about children not having a moral capacity before age six is like an example of how um, how we have to find the, the passages that fit their capacity. So if it's a moral parable or a moral tale, such as Adam and Eve in the garden in Genesis three, it's not appropriate for young children. So right there, you just have a, leave it alone. You know, they're not ready for that, okay? So Cavaletti was a Hebrew scholar. She loved the Hebrew scriptures. And so she, she really took great care to, for children to be ready or to find the time when they were most ready to begin to explore the Hebrew scriptures as Christians. So this would not be true for Jewish children, but, um, and so, you know, she put in place the the parables that weren't more parables, the parables of the kingdom of God, the, you know, the mustard seed and the pearl and so on. And the and the good shepherd is an image for Jesus. And then some of, you know, his birth and the last supper and the resurrection. Uh, you know, these were all appropriate for young children to begin to make friends with and explore. And it would have something to say to them at that very age and then continue to have something to say to them forever. <laughs> So we don't exhaust these texts. Um, as children get a little older, they understand culture. They understand history. History isn't a category they think in either before age six. And so you can't say a long time ago, people thought about God like this. That doesn't mean anything to them. So, but, but when they're old enough to ask a question, that's, that's a clue to you. They're ready to discuss you know, the ins and outs of it. So. Uh, we could be we could begin to say there was a time when people's understanding of God was you know reflected in the culture that they lived in and they offered like the story of Abraham and Isaac sacrifice human sacrifices and then the big question was does our God want that you know the God that has introduced himself to Abraham is that what this God wants and how do we know and then we have this story you know that says very clearly at the end, do not do the least bit of harm to him. So it wasn't just don't kill him. <laughs> do not do the least bit of harm. I mean, it's such a strong statement. And we don't know it. You know, we don't know that sentence. We know this, we, know, we, we have this image of the angels stopping the knife, um, but not this absolute don't do him any harm. So you, you have to, uh, you know, as you read it, you, you start to dig out these things that, that are a little bit clearer than maybe what you grew up with, you know, in the image, the picture of the angel stopping the knife, and that's the end of the story. Uh, and, and they're capable of going really deep. And um, so we put in place those New Testament parables, and they understand from them that Jesus, for example, in the parable of the good shepherd does not kill the wolf. You know, so there's there's an act of nonviolence there. You know, they understand that Jesus laid down his life, but did not kill. And so then how does that carry over into 
they read the Exodus later and, and their, their kids are like, this is not the God you introduced us to. You know, they're very resistant. And that's when we begin to explore, well, what's the context? What's the culture? And they're old enough by age nine to, to carry that in. And I'll, I'll say to kids, you know, how long ago did God say, do not kill? And, you know, they know it's, you know, 4,000 years or so. And then I'll say, and how long do you think it took people to understand what God meant by that? And they'll guess anything, you know, <laughs> but we know what the words mean. And then I said, and, and, and how long did it take for us to obey that? You know, are we much further along than the people <laughs> you know, of the time of Moses? So, so they're, they're, it's so, it's really, it's really wonderful to, to read these passages with, with these kids. They're so frank about what they don't like. And then so open to the information that will help them sort it out. I don't know if that's an answer or not. That's where, <laughs> that's where that came from. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. Mm -hmm. Well, Kevin says, such a wonderful response. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Alan talks about, um, well, Elizabeth, it seems like you've put in the response. Do you want to speak to that? Um, I just, we have, we teach very specific gestures and then add prayers to those gestures, depending on the age range, um, and give very specific direction as to what is happening and the phrase we use just like in church. Um, and so I have a little boy who is absolutely obsessed with communion right now, and he has pin pushed out his own little chalice and patent. And when it's time to lift the chalice, you know, he'll be swinging up an arm when it's time to do an epiclesis, his hands are coming down. Um, he is in it to win it with communion and has been for six months. And so for him, church is not, oh, now we're here. He's like, okay, I know what's going on. I can participate in this community. And he is so excited about it. And I'm now making more work because he wants to know what that picture is and why there's a picture up there. Um, and so we are getting ready to start on advanced parts of the communion set. <laughs> Thanks Thank for that. Um, if I might oh. jump in there, I, one of the things I hear sometimes from undergraduate students that I teach is about, well, when your kids, you're just going through the motions. And I think, my, the motions matter quite a bit. Uh, they may not that that's the form of participation that's the means of expression and uh, you wouldn't say that to some other kids so don't say that about your own self as a young kid you know accept that own it rather than dismissing it thanks thank you yes uh karen louise calls it embodied knowledge that's really where we are going with uh with you know giving uh the three to six year old child the gestures and then to talk more about how it fits into the liturgy and what is the deeper theology behind that as they grow older um but but like when when we write it down it is well the gesture of hypothesis allows for greater participation in the liturgy Right, that when they know that the chalice is prepared with wine and water, what is wine? What is the water? And why is it put together? You know, um, and to then offer them the prayer when they're a little bit older, that allows them to participate in the liturgy more fully. Um, so that's a great segue for me to start talking about the adult. So in the Montessori world, we talk about the triangle of learning, right? The child, the environment, and the adult. So what is the role of the adult? Is the adult even needed if the child has agency and there's a prepared environment? Why do I have to be trained? What is my place here? Um, so to... To think a little bit more about that, the first 
um, relationship that the child encounters or has is with the parents, the child's family. Um, and when we first, when Catherine first asked, who does the child belong to, right? Um, some of us will say, well, to the parents. Yes, to God, but then they come to the parents. Um, this is where they, oh, I'm still doing this. This is where they first develop trust. This is where they first experience unconditional love, right? The kind of love that reflects God's love. Um, it is known that parents um, exert a level of influence on the child across every existential domain that is unmatched by any other influence over the lifespan of the individual. And so it's not just the child, it is the entire lifespan of any individual. Uh, the presence and the model of the parents in their practice of faith is an education itself, right? Regardless of what faith tradition we belong to, the parents model that for the children. Um, in the there, there is in the Judeo-Christian tradition, uh, children, I mean parents, are the primary educators of the children. Um, and Alison Bopnik, a, a psychologist in California, talks about parenting as being either like a carpenter or a gardener. What does a carpenter do? Measures, measures twice before cutting, and makes sure that everything is just so, right? Um, not so the gardener. The gardener sows. Who knows what will germinate? Who knows whether the flower will actually bloom and blossom, right? Um, and then there can be something else entirely because the squirrels have moved the bulbs somewhere else, right? So gardening is an adventure. It calls for flexibility. Um, it calls for openness and acceptance. Whereas with carpentry, there is a goal, there is a product to be produced. With gardening, it can just be joyful. There is wonder, right? So do we parent as carpenters or do we parent as gardeners? Um, how does go, uh, God parent? God, the archetyp uh, archetypical parent. How does God parent us, right? Um, God is more the gardener than the carpenter. Um, and that idea, the metaphor of the parent and God as gardener finds resonance in scriptures um, across the Old Testament and the New Testament. And, um, and then parents are also called to give entirely of themselves, again, to model gnosis of God, right, towards humanity. Um, so for us as religious educators, when we bring children into this prepared environment and facilitate their relationship with God, we also are working with their parents. How can we empower these parents to recognize and reflect God's parenthood of humanity? And then there is the extended family, right? The grandparents, the uncles, the aunts, the cousins. They have a distinct relationship with the extended family. The parent-child relationship is very different from the grandparent-grandchild relationship or uncle-aunt-niece-nephew relationship. Um, others, the extended family, are typically better able to see the child as its own being. Because as a parent, I am too invested in 
um, creating this product, right? The child is an instrument. I live vicariously through my child, and I will admit to that. Um, but the extended family is better able to see the child um, as having agency. Thing that I, as a parent, would be blind to at certain times. So with grandparents, there is, of course, a wisdom that comes from having lived life. Right? Perhaps they started out as being uh, parents like carpenters, but over time, they have become gardeners. Uh, so life experience brings insights that provide care and guidance and a certain unconditional acceptance of the child within that extended family. That said, my question to you, would older family members be more rigid in giving answers and wanting um, traditions to be um, held and continued? Or would they be better able to welcome questions and accept this exploration of space? And then there is the wider community. Children um, are also in a worshiping community. Evolutionarily, alloparenting, um, meaning parenting children uh, that you're not genetically related to. Um, communities helped parents raise their children, whether physically, emotionally, spiritually, all around. Um, and those people in the community, today we're having to create intentional community. Allo parenting is not a natural part of how we live, our faith, or just in the world. Um, but when we intentionally create those communities, those mentors, um, they are able to ignite curiosity in the child. They provide a fresh witness to the Bible and how it can be applied, how the child can live into the covenant with God. They are better able to meet children on their own terms and children, especially adolescents, will gravitate towards those others in the community um, because they feel more welcome, they feel more accepted than in their own homes, often. And finally, educators. What are we as educators all to do? Firstly, to listen deeply, especially for, um, for us who work in Montessori environments. Um, observation, Elizabeth alluded to the fact that over history, uh, throughout history, we've had all these different uh, models of education proposed, but none of them have been scientifically, uh, you know, observed and documented and implemented. Maria Montessori calls us to be saints and scientists. So we listen deeply to the children, carefully, we observe. We step away, you know, and allow the children through their agency to work in the prepared environment. But we observe, we facilitate, we have to guide, and we accompany. Our role is to create that prepared environment, that safe space for exploration, for questions. And we foster essentiality, wonder and joy. So again, if the child has agency who is and is capable of entering into their own relationship with God, and there is the prepared environment, what's my role? Why are we here? Do we even need to have this conversation?
What do you think? I think sometimes children need some words to put around their, their thoughts or their feelings. Uh, sometimes the role of the adult is to help them uh, to express their ideas and they can do that through their artwork as, as well as their drama. Um, so it doesn't need to be verbal, but um, uh, yeah, I think that that's the role. It's, it's part of the uh, encouraging and enabling. Encouraging and enabling. Thank you. Yes, in, in, the, um, in the prepared environment, we do provide children language, language for prayer, language for um, emotional articulation, for conflict resolution. So yes, we, we do provide them. Uh, for children to genuinely have a voice, they also need a listener. Thank you, Karen Marie. So our role is as listeners. Yeah. So with, with the whole idea of the child and the prepared environment and the adult, and that the child has its own agency, what would you, um, what, what, what thoughts or ideas do you have? with that um and as I asked that I thought I heard Catherine wanting to say something I, I just wanted to address your question because the answer is sort of both end but there's there's a huge overarching there are some huge overarching things we can know about children and use them every day like a child under six can't think in history and can't think morally um so that, that guides us, right? That helps us. And it doesn't change for every child. That's generally true. But then there's some very specific um, ways that we can focus on one child and meet their need exactly. And Montessori wrote somewhere, you have to help the child get attached to the environment so that they can learn from it. And so do whatever it takes. <laughs> you know? And I remember a boy who said to me, he had been with me for six years, but it, it, in fourth grade, he said, you know, yeah, I could tell he was like getting disconnected. And I was thinking, what can I do? What can I do? And his mom had told me that when he goes home, he looks at birds. He sits in the yard and watches birds. And so I put up a bird feeder and attached it to the window in the atrium. Everybody comes to the atrium. No child mentions it or sees it or notices it. But he came to me at the end and he said, you know, I was thinking about not coming anymore, but I see you have a bird feeder in the window. So I'm going to come back. <laughs> and so that's the particular, that's how particular we may need to be to serve a child, you know, but we do also have the help of these general, you know, general developmental um, observations of Montessori and Capital. Yeah. Um, Jenny says um, that empowering parents to be primary educators is a real challenge that parents want to hand their kids off to professionals. And they have a lot of anxiety around being told that they have a role in faith formation. That is true. I, I am actually going through that in my parish right now. Um, it takes time. Uh, there, there is a lot of um, inviting that I do to bring them into uh, whether it is the worship or uh, discussions about um, how to grow the domestic church and um, what they can do with their children. Sure, you could just pray at bedtime with this verse, you know? Um, and over time, it seems to ease their anxiety, but you're right, it, there, there is a lot of anxiety around that. Um, Kimball, is that how I say your name? Thank you. Um, as educators, we are also able to provide model for parents, relatives, uh, and fellow parents, as that mod that way of being is not most folks' as default way of being. Any other thoughts? 
Don't you think parents are overcoming a lifetime of being told you don't know? <laughs> let the let the clergy tell you, you know, and then it's very hard to step up, I think, you know. Yeah. So do you guys really believe that children have agency of their own? <laughs> Elizabeth Nolan, I saw you wanting to say something. <laughs> yeah, I was I was going to respond as a clergy. Um, and and there's this double double thing about um, not just children. I think I'm I'm far, I'm far more tolerant of children uh, having uh, these ideas, but I get I get fairly frustrated with um, with adults who have a very narrow view of God or what, uh, and I'm being condemnatory here, uh, what I think is a wrong view um, of, of various uh, theological concepts. And, um, and I don't want them to pass them on to children. <laughs> so there is this, um, this question of, you know, uh, how much agency and 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 how much quote unquote heresy can we allow if it's going to be deforming you know never tell a child anything he has to unlearn uh, later in life um but anyway i'll stop at that point so yeah <laughs> it's not that i know everything uh i learn a huge amount from both children and adults but but the question of uh, when do we need to hold up the mirror and say stop as Maria Harris uh, talked about years ago. That's right, right. Okay. It's Jenny, Jenny, go ahead. Can, can you hear me because I'm outside? Is that all right? Okay. It's interesting because you know, I actually started my work in religious education with young children, and I'm actually a trained catechist um, at all three levels. And so in a way, this is like my my love area, but, you know, graduating out of my PhD where I got a job was with young adults. <laughs> um, and what's been, um, you know, and at first I kind of thought, oh gosh, you know, whole new developmental stage. Here's a, But you really do realize how much um, early childhood is, in, is a template about the essentials in terms of human spirituality and human experience and the way that, um, CGS for sure, and Montessori as well, that, you know, and there may also be, I don't, I'm not going to be able to catalog all the uh, people who've observed this, uh, you know, sort of the way that they've zeroed in on what's important, like at this stage, doesn't cease to be important later. Um, it just takes new forms. But agency in particular is something that has ended up playing a bigger role, um, like the whole questions around agency in my work with young adults than I thought it would because of something sort of related to what you're saying now, Elizabeth, which is that, um, you know, I'm coming from the Eastern Orthodox tradition and we get a lot of challenges to the idea that, you know, like even adults should have agency in thinking theologically, thinking creatively about theology, all these things. Um, and the particular project I've been working with is is about how parishes can be more open and supportive of young adults where they actually are in life, as opposed to where we assume or presume or want them to be. <laughs> um, and I found that I've had to get down to this very like essential and brass tacks kind of um, piece of logic with priests where I'm saying, look, with if you don't give your young adults agency, it's not that you're robbing them necessarily of, you know, heretical theology or you know, you're keeping them from all those things. You're, at, you're also robbing them of the, the possibility of virtue. Because without agency, there is no virtue. Like, unless we can make choices, we are never going to make good choices either. Like, <laughs> um, and so the, the development of the will in a healthy direction is so critical as a piece of um, faith formation over the lifespan and it starts with the kid being able to choose to reach and switch the light switch 
like, or reach and take the thing off the shelf. Like, you know, if everything makes it impossible for them to um, activate their own agency, then eventually they just start to believe that they're powerless in these ways. And, you know, my morality, my virtue is not my responsibility anymore. Like, you know, somebody else is going to go do it for me or, you know, it just, it becomes very disordered because at the end of the day, human beings direct their behavior out of their sense of a will and agency. <laughs> like, um, and so it's like, it's not, it's not an option for you to give your, for you to develop your young adult's will. Like, it's not like, if you don't, you're not keeping them from bad spiritual things. You're cutting them off from spirituality completely, like in the end, you know, um, or it's going to be something very amorphous, nothing that they feel deeply connected to. Their choices have to matter. They have to actually affect something like um, otherwise, what are we doing? Like, you know, what are we here for? So, um, you know, and, and Montessori taught me that, like, and so to be able to turn around and say it to priests about 25 year olds, when they're like, oh, well, we've never done that that way. I don't think they can do that in the church. I'm like, well, like, what can they do in the church then? <laughs> you know, like, it's like, are you going to judge every single thing and decide like, you know, so you get my, my drift. Yeah. I think playing with ideas is really important, you know, right from early childhood. I, I in the 1980s, the, when I first came across Fowler's, um, you know, faith development theory, I was heretical and wanted to say that instead of people developing, I think they degenerate um, from, from children's concepts of God, which are so open uh, to um, more limited uh, times by the time they get to be stage three con conventional. So, I mean, I, I totally agree with the essentialness of allowing that, that um, uh, agency and of ex uh, for adults exploring with the children, because I do believe that out of the mouths of babes and sucklings comes, comes great wisdom. And I believe that God speaks Holy Spirit through all ages that is very true. Uh, I'm I'm talking about adults who have absorbed the the fake truth stuff of sure. of some. Oh, no, liberty. I wasn't accusing you of that, Elizabeth. No, I know, I know. I was just re I'm, recognizing the shadow side. <laughs> to sort of just, <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, oh, Karen Mui says um, because sixty percent of millennial parents in the U.S did not participate in a religious community as children. It creates a significant deficit in embodied learning for sharing a faith journey with their children. Um, and that kind of dovetails with Alan's uh, comment that, you know, if parents haven't found their voice yet, how do they help children find their voices? So. Yeah, so there is a lot of work to be done with children, with parents, with the community. And so, yes, Eileen. Has, has, has anyone, I, I mean, I'm sorry, I missed the beginning of this session because I was uh, on a yoga mat at a class. <laughs> um, so, Recent studies in um, attachment issues in children who've had early childhood traumas of one form or another um, suggest that children with a disorganized attachment may have trouble attaching to God as well. Is there Has there been any attention yet to sort of how we might facilitate that kind of thing when the child has stuff that we had no power in. Certainly is a good area for somebody to look into because I also know just from stories of friends of my own and, and people in my family that it can also, like having a disordered attachment to your human family sometimes relationship with faith takes like an like a power a more powerful role in the sense of like 
I feel like I have a parent in God in a way that I never had in my own family. So it, there's a lot to explore there, I think, Eileen. Yeah, it, it, the, the response or the reaction could go either way. Like Jenny said, it could be, well, I have found security, stability, you know, attachment with God, or it could be the other way. Like um, uh, Juan Balthazar says, you know, the, the relationship, the bonding with the parent reflects the bonding with God relationship with God and so if there are adverse childhood events there's trauma and that attachment is affected so it could go either way and I don't think there's well I am not aware of um, enough well Elizabeth has put up a book attached to God a practical guide to deeper spiritual experience um and the Children's Spirituality Hub is funding research on the effects of trauma on children's religiosity. Mm -hmm. So it looks like there's some research in, going on in that regard. I don't know there, there it has been published yet. Karen Marie, you can correct me. No, it's just starting, uh, at least in terms of Ramona Grad's work. But, um, but Elizabeth Weiss has put something in that looks like it's already um, out. This is not aimed at children. This is aimed at adults who are recognizing that they have disordered attachments um, and wondering how that works in their spirituality. Uh, Crispin Mayfield is a psychiatrist out of the West Coast of the U.S. Um, and has is, this is like his area of therapy and work that he does. It is not an academic. It is not heavily cited as an academic work. Right. The that opening chapter of the religious potential of the child, which is Sophia Cavalletti's seminal work, is called God and the Child. And she cites in their stories of children who were who had no exposure to faith or had an adverse exposure, and yet their relationship with God somehow was, you know, in place. And and what she was trying to say is we have to have some trust in the agency of God <laughs> as well yeah. as the child, you know that they can do this, you know, at any age, uh, we cannot give up on the possibility of relationship, you know, between God and the person. Mm 